So um, to kind of kick things off, um, our first speaker is Jenny Shaw, who is the Collections Development Manager at uh, the Welcome Collection. So uh, Jenny will be talking to us um, through diversity and inclusion in archival, in UK archival collection development. Jenny will share her research on how archives have attempted to develop their collections in a more inclusive way uh, to include a wider range of perspectives. Jenny will talk through about how archival theory can support my, more diverse collections and looking at how uh, some archival practice uh, can explore some of the challenges of uh, measuring progress. Uh, Jenny Shaw, as I mentioned earlier, is the Collections Development Manager for Welcome. Uh, Jenny's interested in how archival uh, collecting can be more representative and inclusive and of non-dominant perspectives. So I'll hand over to Jenny. Cool, thank you. So hello, I'm Jenny Shaw and in my day job, I'm the Collections Development Manager at Welcome Collection. Um, I'm afraid that my um, slides are quite boring, so I've illustrated them with things from our collection, which are um, slightly random. Oh, I'm trying to move my slide on. Uh, okay, there it is. Sorry, there's a really big delay on my slide, so apologies um, if it's out of sync. Um, I lead the team responsible for developing our collections in support of our vision of a world in which everyone's experience of health matters. Today, I'd like to talk about the research that I did on diversity and inclusion in UK archival development as part of my fellowship. The idea for this research fellowship came out of considering an application to the acceptance in lieu scheme. For those of you not familiar with it, this scheme is administered by the Arts Council and allows material of cultural, scientific or historical significance to be gifted to, the pub to a public institution, such as a library, museum or archive, and sees a reduction in the amount of inheritance tax that needs to be paid. Unsurprisingly, for a scheme which um, benefits those with larger estates, the archive material that's gifted to the nation through the scheme is not the most diverse. Um, in 2022, the archives included were two relating to high-ranking military careers, three related to the estate papers of families with land and titles, two of high-profile published authors, and one was scientific papers of a scientist with a knighthood and a Nobel Prize. Um, these acquisitions of collections are important, but I was interested in other types of collection development taking place. I wanted to explore ideas around value and knowledge, including how different forms of knowledge are valued um, and inequalities of esteem. I was also interested in finding out more about activity across the UK archive sector, particularly um, working with those traditionally excluded from archive collections. Um, my fellowship can be broken down into three main areas of research, um, archival theory on developing collections, investigating practice in UK archives, and recording information and measuring progress. So looking at archival theory, it's unsurprising that dominant groups feature so prominently in archival theory and archival collections. Power lies in our institutions, which have dominant characteristics baked into their structures. Much of the Western canon of archival theory comes from 20th century experience of working with traditional, hierarchical, bureaucratic organisations. This has led to generations of archives and archivists employing practices that are based on archival theory rooted in dominance, including appraisal methodologies that overrepresent dominant groups. One problem is that these structures, theories and practices are seen as the norm, the mainstream, and as such are not named or stated. Um, to quote Michelle Caswell, these perspectives have masqueraded as unnamed universals in both methodologies for determining archival value and lingering assertions about the alleged neutrality of the archivist. Um, I found this concept of naming the dominant perspective of WebCham, which Hope Olson explores in her article, Patriarchal Structures of Subject Access and Subver Subversive Techniques for Change, um, an interesting lens to look at archival collections through. So considering the white, ethnically European, bourgeois, Christian, heterosexual, able-bodied male, to which others have also added citizen and cis, 
um, by naming this dominant concept, it makes explicit what has been implied. And I think it's quite a useful concept to hold and consider when thinking about archival collections. For my research, I've been considering the extent to which archival collecting in the UK extends beyond this um, position of dominance, how many steps we take away from it, how much intersectionality there is. Through my research um, into archival theory, I found some ideas and approaches that I think are quite useful when attempting to diversify the range of voices represented um, within archive collections and reflecting how they might influence my practice. Um, so in her article, Dusting for Fingerprints, Introducing Feminist Standpoint Appraisal, Michelle Caswell highlights feminist epistemology of valuing the knowledge gained through lived experience this valuing of lived experience resonated with the work that we've been doing at Welcome Collection. This has been evident recently in our collecting around art and health, where many artists express experience of their own health or treatment through their creative art output. Collections from artists such as Brian Charnley, who expressed his experience of living with schizophrenia, sits alongside those from medical professionals and charities working in this area, such as psychiatrists, mental health charities, art therapists. If our traditional structures value certain records, voices and forms of knowledge over others, then community archives can act as powerful counter narratives to official history and archives. Through my research, I've been speaking to people involved in community archives, including those in more traditional archives, many of whom are attempting to support post-custodial models of collecting in their areas. But even with community-led archives, there are still quite a lot of structural issues, um, as those with time, space, and other resources needed to collect and care for archives, it, it tends to still have those dominant features. There are a lot of factors involved in whether material survives once it's no longer needed for current use. To start with, some groups, individuals and organisations are more likely to produce records in the course of their activities. For example, organisations arranged along bureaucratic lines are more likely to create rock records than those with less formal structures. Businesses providing a service like hairdressers are likely to create far fewer records than architectural firms and manufacturing companies. Then some accumulations of records are more likely to survive than others those with space to store material, private offices, country estates, and with administrative support to support them with that. Religious groups without their own buildings, such as those whose congregations meet in rented spaces, schools, cinemas, community spaces, will have a very different experience of attempting to store records than those who have their own formal buildings. Finally, there's an element of those who have experience of archives or who see themselves already represented in archive collections who are more likely to see the value in the material that they hold. So although community archives have huge potential to disrupt the archive, they, um, they can provide a greater range of voices, but they are not a silver bullet. So looking at my next theory, um, it's important not to dismiss all of Western canon of archival theory and one area where attempting to diversify approaches um, and traditional archival theory can come together quite successfully is participatory approaches. Archivists have a long history and plentiful experience of preserving context and of recognizing the value of how, when, and why records were produced. Gaining a thorough understanding of the institution or person who created the records, maintaining the original order to preserve the relationship between records and knowledge architecture in which we're, they were created are core archival skills, which can be put to use in the service of participatory practice. This approach requires careful consideration of the power balance that exists between archival repositories and record creators, alongside a lot of cooperation and dialogue. Participatory archiving asks that choices made in the process are made explicit and transparent. The importance, once again, of making visible what has often been obscured by the archival process. Um, and finally, I'd like to highlight the potential for slow archives, which dismantle the capitalist model of production of trying to find efficiencies and approaches which work at scale. The slow archives approach of trying uh, is about focusing differently, listening carefully and acting ethically. 
By slowing down, we can help to build sustained partnerships over longer periods of time, meeting people where they are, letting them set the pace of interactions and navigating the things that look like barriers for them together. So moving on to look at my next area of research, archival practice. I was interested in finding out more about some of the work that's been going on across the UK archival sector that could support more diverse collecting. Um, one feature of my fellowship is that I had a mentor at the National Archives who really helped me to identify relevant groups. Um, I was also supported by the regional and networks team who generously shared their knowledge of work happening in their areas. This was not intended to be a comprehensive survey of archival practice. Instead, it was an opportunity to explore some different approaches. Um, I managed to speak with seven different groups and individuals during my fellowship. Um, and during these interviews, we looked at the history of their collecting, the motivations for collecting in particular areas, the approaches they took, how the material is managed or might be managed in the longer term, some of their successes, and some of the barriers or blocks that they might have experienced with their collecting efforts, and whether there's been any change um, over time. I'm still working on editing these transcripts um, and ensuring that the en interviewees are satisfied with the final version. Um, I'm going to talk about this area of my research in more detail at the Archives and Records Association conference in August. Um, in addition to the detailed investigation into certain archives or groups, I also wanted to get a broad set of data from across the sector to see if it was possible to discern change over time. I was interested in using the annual accession to repositories data. Um, for those of you not familiar with it, accessions to repositories is an annual survey organized by the National Archives. It aims to collect information about archive and manuscript accessions in the preceding calendar year. A summary of this data is available on TNA's website from 1994 to 2021, with the return for 2022 currently being processed. Unfortunately, the information contained within these surveys was not consistent enough or clean enough data to allow meaningful analysis in the time that I had available for my research. Um, some of the, the issues included free text, which is difficult to extract information from, with information spread across multiple fields, such as creator or description, making it difficult to deploy data analysis. Um, inconsistent date formats, um, accession dates are normally fairly inexact, um, but the formats varied wildly, um, with some were precise, some were spans, some were estimates, some were brackets. Um, others were non-valid date formats, such as question marks, unknown or ND, not no date and various um, variations of those. There was also quite a lot of inconsistency in the extent formats, so shows number of boxes, linear meters, cubic meters, numbers of volumes or um, data um, for digital accessions. So although many archivists are now using accessioning modules in their collections management systems, a lot of the practice still harks back to the paper accession register. So although we now store our data in the databases, a lot of it's much more suited to human readers than machines. Um, in 2019, the Canadian Council of Archives created an accession information standard and an attempt to overcome some of these problems. It should create more uniformity in the use of fields and has mandatory fields, but the crucial issue of data in the key fields like date is still left to repository's own standards. So it doesn't overcome all of the issues. Um, this has made me reflect a lot on my own accession process at Welcome Collection. Um, we do have internal guidance on how to complete the fields to try to improve consistency. Um, we clearly mark accruals. We have a standard way of expressing dates. We express the extent in a traditional box um, number kind of way. And then we convert this to cubic meters to assist in collections management planning. Um, I'd like to do a bit more work in this area. So I'd like to investigate some of the analyzing the information to spot trends um, with fewer but larger accessions, create summaries such as proportion of accruals, internal transfers, new collections, et cetera, but also demonstrating how our collecting supports our vision. Um, taking a different approach to collections development has huge potential to disrupt some of the dominance in the archives, 
but there are a lot of challenges. Um, a lot of the approaches are very resource intensive and will only ever be a small step away from the dominance. It's ingrained in a lot of traditional record keeping structures. There's also no certainty of resulting in traditional success measures, which are normally um, donations of collections to archives. So this raises quite important questions about how do we measure success in collections development? And I think if our current measures don't fit um, this measure of success, then we're, maybe we need to develop some new um, measures based more on outcomes rather than outputs. Um, thank you, that's me. Thank you very much, uh, Jenny. Um, so we'll move on to our next presentation, um, which is by uh, Holly Smith, who is the project archivist working on the Women's Aid Federation of England archive at the University of Leeds. Um, Holly will be introducing us uh, to the Women's Aid Federation archive, talking through some of the ways her TNA RLUK professional fellowship into inclusive cataloging practice has affected her approach to documenting this significant collection. So I'll hand it over to Holly now. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Holly Smith. I'm the project archivist for the Women's Aid Federation of England Archive, which is held up at the University of Leeds Special Collections. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen shared there. Um, I'm looking at inclusive cataloging. Um, so I have been a professional fellow um, with the National Archives and Research Libraries UK for most of 2022 up until February 2023. And as you've heard, these fellowships um, allowed us to kind of pick a research topic and run with it, basically, which has been great. And we've also been encouraged to network, get involved with wider archive discussions and produce outputs that help to overcome some of the challenges found in the archive and heritage worlds today. So like I say, I've picked inclusive cataloguing um, because mainly I felt that my role as archivist for the Women's Ed Archive provided a great case study for this. So my original fellowship title um, was the rather catchy um, documenting complex histories, balancing multifaceted representation of marginalized histories with accessible archive navigation, which is quite a mouthful, but basically sums up the paradox that got me quite interested in inclusive cataloging in the first place. So it's this um, documenting of complex layered descriptions that authentically represent voices in an archive. But then on the other side is the importance of ensuring simplicity and accessibility and easy navigation for researchers. So these seem kind of at odds with each other. Um, and it's a tricky question to see how we can achieve both uh, and get a catalogue that's both representative, um, but also quite welcoming and accessible to researchers. So this is the kind of path that led me to the general theme of inclusive cataloging, which is much, much less of a mouthful to say. Um, and it really allowed me to chuck myself a real range of outputs for the fellowship, um, some of which I'm gonna talk about um, today. So all of the themes are slightly interlinked, um, but I'm gonna pull out three of them. So the first is gonna be quite a general look at cataloging, but in particular focusing on access points and sensitivity. I'm then gonna go on to talk about trauma-informed practice. And finally, uh, I'm excited to share some of the work I've been doing around community engagement. But first, um, I want to quickly introduce you to the Women's Aid Archive. Um, so as I said, the Women's Aid Archive has provided me a great case study for my research. As I'm sure you're all aware, uh, women's voices are often absent in traditional archives or collections. Um, so this archive is quite a rarity. It's uh, records that are inspired, created and used by women. And my fellowship has allowed me to really focus time in on how I can do that justice. So I would like to flag at this stage that the Women's Aid Archive looks at domestic abuse. Women's Aid is a domestic abuse charity um, and our archive interacts with various sensitive issues around this topic. I won't be overtly mentioning details of domestic abuse during this presentation, but I will share some details at the end for anyone that might feel affected by some of the stuff we uh, discuss or see on the screen. 
Uh, so Women's Aid is an acclaimed domestic abuse charity that works as the national coordinating body for local domestic abuse services. They provide information, training, resources, as well as lobbying and campaigning for women's rights and legislative change. Women's Aid has been at the forefront of the forefront of the refuge movement for almost half a century, and they're due to celebrate their 50th anniversary in 2024. So Women's Aid emerged out of the activism around the women's liberation movement in the 70s. They were back then known as the National Women's Aid Federation. So you can see some of the uh, anagrams on the screen now. Um, and back then they were initially seen as quite a radical activist group. They were raising awareness of very taboo subjects at the time, like domestic abuse and also the idea of gendered violence. But in the span of 20 years, coming forward to the 90s and beyond, Women's Aid transformed into a highly respected organisation for its original research and expertise. They're still operating today and have helped make astonishing changes to the lives of women and children suffering abuse. So this very brief introduction kind of gives you an insight into how rich and complex this history is. So it not only discusses the history of the domestic abuse movement, but also women's liberation, refuges, social history, legal history, and so much more. So I really wanted to ensure I was making this represented and accessible in our catalogues. So just to come to that first pit stop, looking at cataloguing in general. So at an early stage in my fellowship, I held a researcher event and I asked attendees what their main entry points were for archive catalogues. Uh, and I thought this was quite an interesting kind of starting point. So the most popular answer was searching for key people or organizations. This was closely followed by a more generic free text search. And then came things like dates, uh, finding aids were quite high up there and also stuff like location, subject, and at the bottom was browsing the archive hierarchy. So this reflects a general feeling in archives at the moment, a move away from that hierarchical um, search function into a more focused look on individual records and descriptions. So this made me want to approach cataloguing the Women's Aid archive by hitting those main metadata entry points having really informative, succinct descriptions and just really getting that creator date location uh, system up and running. So this is particularly um, important for things like our external organization series. So you can see here in the middle, um, this is from our international files series, um, some stuff from Denmark. So being able to put things like location and creators and dates for that kind of stuff immediately makes it much more searchable. It was also great to see finding aids up there and that researchers were using them to access catalogues. So one way we've been covering this is by devising volunteer indexing projects. So you can see here some of our lovely volunteers working to index our newspaper clippings, our audio visual collection. We've also got people working on our staff meeting series. And I can already tell these are going to be an amazing resource for opening up areas of the archive that otherwise would have been quite overwhelming for researchers to approach single handedly. So for this area, my main fellowship outputs have been quite simple, but it's basically coming down to a more informed catalogue. And then also in this theme, I wanted just to go over sensitive um, language in archive descriptions as I'd previously done some work on this and really enjoyed figuring out workflows around it. And my fellowship allowed me to come back um, and spend some more time thinking about it. So um, settling on an approach around sensitivity statements and the processes around flagging records is definitely never easy. And there's simultaneously a load of ways we could be doing this, but also none of them quite seem perfect. So my fellowship allowed me to go out and visit some archives and network and see how people are doing it. I went to the National Archives, the Bishopsgate and uh, the Women's Library in the London School of Economics. And basically everyone's approaching it slightly differently and trying their best in a field of archiving that doesn't really have any guidelines yet and can be quite controversial in how we approach it. And like I say, workflows had already been established in our special collections, but the fellowship allowed me to uh, go back into this with help from amazing colleagues and reword our statements and make it clearer how they're being used. 
I don't have time to go into all of that now, um, but if anyone wants to discuss um, sensitive language, my email's at the end. I'm more than happy to um, talk to people about it. But for now, I wanted to focus on the output in terms of my fellowship, and that was a sensitivity policy. Um, so this was basically setting out a clear, transparent way, the what, how and why of the processes around dealing with sensitive language in our archives and including some caveats about how the process isn't going to be perfect and how we'll be reviewing it periodically going forward. We also wanted to signpost how people can contact us if they spot mistakes or want to know more. So this policy was a really great way of championing transparency and it's an output I'm really proud of involved um, of involving this fellowship and it's allowed me to be more thoughtful about how we deal with some of the sensitive material in the Women's Aid Archive. So the next uh, whistle stop tour is um, trauma and farm practice. So as you can tell from the history of the archive, I uh, gave you an introduction to and also this work around sensitivity. The Women's Aid Archive deals with a lot of potentially triggering subjects. For example, on these slides and some of the ones before, we've seen relatively low level examples of uh, posters and postcards that were readily available to the public. But even with these, we can see examples of historic language such as battered wives and quite emotive references to violence. And despite its obviousness, it was actually only when we came to discuss our volunteer program that we really took a step back and realized we needed some set guidelines and measures in place to ensure the well-being of people interacting with the archive. So we began to research trauma-informed practice. And this is a growing recognition of the impact trauma can have on people, particularly being aware of the symptoms of vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue, such as desensitization, apathy, burnout, and basically how they can present themselves in a number of different ways in different people. So in the archive world, it's really relevant because we're often dealing with very personal, emotive, historic material. The popularity of the Trauma-Informed Archives Community of Practice group is testament to this. So they're an online forum that regularly discuss case studies of um, secondary trauma in archives, emotional responses to records, and the emotional labor of archivists. And their resources are really useful, so I recommend people uh, reaching out to them and taking a look. So, um, we kind of took this and did more research around trauma-informed work, both in archives and kind of wider, looking at medical um, things also. And we came up with two outputs, a volunteer handbook and a volunteer management checklist. So the volunteer handbook goes over the type of material volunteers might come across during the project, informs them on vicarious trauma, shares relevant resources, and basically gives them a toolkit on how to approach their own personal ways of dealing with sensitive material. The volunteer management checklist outlines what we should, what should be done by us as managers during, after, before, during and after a volunteer project to ensure a duty of care to our volunteers. So this includes things like an introductory tour of the archive, being aware of different people's triggers and having set breaks during the day. For example, we'd be sure to go for a coffee break each session this got us outside with some distance from the archive and basically gave everyone uh, a chance to talk about how they were feeling or what they've seen in the archive that day. We've had some great feedback from volunteers and uh, through this work, we've also learned the importance of transferring this to staff as well and also researchers. So basically all of this is another way of making the Women's Aid Archive more transparent, welcoming and inclusive as possible. So the third and final bit I wanted to talk about um, was community engagement. So a lot of what's been discussed so far has focused on the access side of the scale. So how to make records easier to find, how to create an empathetic and welcoming environment for users. But the real area I've been able to solely focus on representation has been through community engagement. The big idea underpinning this is that we as archivists aren't the subject specialists. We don't own this history. We need to build relationships with those whose stories we are trying to tell. So for us, the main contender here was Women's Aid themselves. We wanted the Women's Aid Archive to authentically represent the functionality of their organization, 
So I made sure the Women's Aid um, representatives provided feedback on things like collection structure, runs of documents and key names. So these little things are just small interventions, but in doing so, we're ensuring a more accurate representation of the Women's Aid voice. So this project also benefited from quite close communication with Feminist Archive North as well. So that is a collective whose collections are also housed in the Uni of Leeds Special Collections. And Feminist Archive North, also known as FAN, is entirely run by volunteers. And a lot of them were actually involved in the activism of the women's liberation movement back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, you often see names coming up that were key in the uh, setting up a feminist archive north in the Women's Aid archive as well. So that's a lovely little link. Um, so this basically makes FAN a really great group for doing community engagement with, because for a lot of them, this is their story. They know way more about it than I ever would. And I found it really valuable to share material we're working on with them as their expertise and personal experience is really useful. For example, the items you can see on the screen here um, show a march in Birmingham, all three different things linked to the same march. It's in Birmingham, it's in 1979, but apart from that, we didn't really know much else. So I showed it to Fan and they were able to use their networks to find out a bit more. And they told us that at this time in 1979, Birmingham was uh, one of the only large cities that didn't have a council funded refuge. A local group even went as far as to squat in a house, but the council still didn't cave uh, and set up funding for one. So Women's Ed organized a massive national demonstration in Birmingham and sent coaches to bring women and children to protest from all over England. Not long after, Birmingham Council agreed and a refuge was set up. So it's this kind of feedback um, and this kind of way of using community engagement that really provides personal details and presents the kind of information you can't gain through a simple, go a simple Google search. It highlights perfectly how engagement with relevant groups can really enrich your understanding and documentation of a collection. So it was this... Um, kind of foundation that led me to organize my final fellowship output, an engagement event where we invited staff and volunteers working in local domestic abuse services in Leeds and Bradford to come in and view some of the archive. We called the event Your Story, just to really highlight the fact that this was their narrative and we were eager to share it with them and learn from them in return. So we ran it um, to align with the week of International Women's Day. So this was only a few weeks ago um, and we had two main aims going into it. The first was to raise awareness of our archive within this stakeholder group. And the second was to encourage knowledge exchange. So inspire these women to share their thoughts, experiences and reminiscences with us. So I think it's really important with community engagement in general to approach things ethically but it felt especially important to cover this with our event. So not only does the Women's Aid Archive cover a range of potentially triggering subject areas, but I was also aware that the women were invite, that we were inviting to this were doing important work in the domestic abuse field, and I didn't want to take their time away from this. So one way I kind of tried to approach this was reaching out to organisations fairly early on, a good few months in advance of the event. And this was just in the form of an introductory email. I wanted to explain who I was, uh, what an archive was and what the Women's Aid Archive was doing and the project surrounding it. I could then follow this up a few weeks later with an official invite to the event, which was still sent out far in advance. This meant that people knew me, they knew what I was doing, they knew the context of the event and anyone wanting to attend still had lots of time to factor it into their schedules. We also ensured we were providing refreshments and a lunch and offering to pay travel expenses. We also made it a two hour drop in event so people could be flexible about when they turned up. More than anything, we wanted to pick out some amazing items that would really give an insight into the history of women's aid and the domestic abuse movement. As this is the history that many of the attendees didn't know or would be eager to find out more about. We could share that information with them and in return, they could offer insight from personal experience. So you can see a few items on the screen here uh, that we shared with them. So there's stuff that's quite aesthetically exciting, such as the newsletters, which are those middle two um, images 
also the calendars are always a good shout and things like that information pack on setting up a refuge was a really great way of starting conversations because we could immediately compare it with how refuges are run nowadays. So we kind of had the basis there to really start conversations and engagement and get people discussing the items. But how were we capturing this information? I knew from my fellowship research that this was the tricky bit and I could talk your ear off for much longer than my 20 minute slot about the debates around user generated content and current database capacities. But all I knew is that I just wanted to record these stories and information shared with us as quickly and easily as possible. So I did this by creating a very simplistic farm that our volunteers could use to jot down stuff whilst they were talking to and encouraging participants at the event. So it turned out this was quite a juggling exercise. It maybe wasn't the perfect way of doing it, but we still got some great anecdotes and reflections out of it. So uh, one woman remembered taking women and children from a refuge on a canal holiday. Um, there were also reminiscences looking at the old newsletters like the ones on the screen here about the process of making them on old bander machines and then delivering them on bikes. There's also a mention of uh, the whooping cough going round a Lee's refuge in the 80s. And that provoked a um, conversation with a woman who compared it to working in uh, a Leeds refuge through COVID. We also got some really great emotive responses and feedback that helped to highlight the significance of women's aid and our collection. So one of the poems in the calendar, like the one on the screen here, um, reminded one woman of a conversation she'd had with someone just that same week. There was also a mention of Muslim and Southeast Asian communities in some of our newsletters. And one attendee um, started talking about the stereotype of women from these groups being voiceless, but she noted the importance of changing that narrative. And she was quoted saying, change society rather than just put a plaster on it. A great comment I loved is um, someone saying there's a real sense that women's aid was genuinely leading a revolution back then and that women working there were single-minded individuals dedicating their lives to a cause. So this was all amazing stuff, and I was so happy with the outcomes we got from it. But how is this going to feed into representation? So through this engagement event, I undeniably gained um, more of a context and understanding of the world of domestic abuse services. Even just by chatting about the photos we showed and laughing at some of the poems in the calendar or comparing what was happening then to our local area at the moment. And in terms of our notes, I've transcribed all the farms and that information is now ready in a document to help enhance catalogue descriptions, contribute to additional contexts like blog posts, publications or collections guides, or to help with future engagement and outreach such as exhibitions. It's very early days. This only happened a few weeks ago, so I haven't used this information in these ways yet. But through my research, I've seen many case studies where the amazing engagement events produce rich, valuable information that's ultimately lost because it's not appropriately stored or maintained. So my final act of respect to these amazing women that came to our event will be to ensure their words are looked after and used and use them to make our catalogue that much more representative. So there we have it. That's a very vague and probably quite rambly whistle-stop tour of how I've looked at inclusive cataloguing uh, and the Women's Aid Archive. I'm very grateful to the National Archives and Research Libraries UK for the opportunity to think deeper about these subjects alongside my project archivist role. And although my fellowship has ended, I know that this mindset is gonna continue for the rest of the Women's Aid contract and beyond. So thank you very much. And please feel free to contact me with my email on the screen or to ask questions at the end of this event. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Holly. Um, just a, a reminder before we move on, we move on to the next uh, presentation. If you've got any questions at all, um, please submit them through the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, next, we're joined by uh, Rachel uh, Minot, who is going to share her research into the user desire for diverse narratives in archives and the ethical and practical considerations for capturing record subjects and creators' uh, racial identity in archival catalogues, um, exploring this within the frame of the need to challenge normative assumptions of uh, people's identity when information is absent.
Um, Rachel is a uh, Jamaican born artist, curator, and researcher. She's currently the Joint Head of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the National Archives, as well as the Joint Head of Participation at Birmingham Museums Trust. Um, so I'll hand over to Rachel now. Thank you very much. Um, are you able to hear me all right and see the slides? Uh, yeah, everything's up and running. Perfect, thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to um, be able to speak alongside Jenny and Holly. Um, you'll be able to see that there's been quite a bit of cross-section with a lot of our research. And so it's been a real privilege to um, undertake the fellowship um, with them. Uh, I have a, 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 an extension on my fellowship, so I haven't quite reached my final conclusions. And so I really want to encourage anyone to um, make any suggestions or comments um, um, and critique, I'm always really open to critique um, throughout this presentation as it will really help me in terms of kind of coming to my conclusions. Um, so my title for my fellowship was Capturing Diversity and Challenging Normative Assumptions or Record Subjects. And this is, was something that came about because of in my, my, role, my previous role as Inclusion and Change Manager at the National Archives within Archive Sector Development. I received a lot of queries from the sector on how to make their diverse narratives more visible. Um, what happens when um, you get a call from someone internally in the organization to profile your the first um, people of color who worked in the organization or the first women who worked in the organization and um, they're finding that it was very difficult to access that information. Alongside this, um, I was often finding that um, that there is a tendency for erasure of this constant kind of focus on the first and many times in particularly when I was doing work around black history records there was an often um, a reinvention of this first um, and the an erasure of some of the histories to come and part of that is to do with you know historical underinvestment in um, projects that already did that work to find the first um, but part of it is also kind of concerning where this information goes in our records. So that's some of the kind of foundations of why I was interested in this idea. Um, I apologize, my slides are very wordy um, and I'll try to not just read them verbatim, but also to try and make them as interesting as possible. Um, but my research was kind of exploring particularly um, what's included and excluded in descriptions of our record subjects and record creators in archival databases versus the sort of information that people actually wanted and, and were using in different um, formats. So for example, in search engines or conversations or self descriptions um, and being really mindful, particularly of the latter being something that's gaining a lot more traction especially around different marginalizations and the complex language around um, describing um, people's identity. And then considering the ways in which we could challenge normative assumptions when there's absence. So um, my research primarily focuses on race, but it, will, it crosses kind of all other protected characteristics and was really influenced by a lot of other research in different areas but ex exploring what happens when there is when this information isn't present and what assumptions people are making um and so for example so in this context it was specifically this assumption of whiteness if if race wasn't kind of uh, mentioned and then i wanted to look to see if there were spaces in our database for this information to be usefully um, stored and sorted and policies around collecting and managing this data that were in place and then i and then because information around different protected characteristics, including race, are um, special category data, I wanted to look um, at what changes when some when a record subject is living and dead in, in terms of the legal changes and also what happens um, in terms of our ethics, because our responsibility around that data changes um, within in that context, but um, do, what does what is our ethical imperative? And really kind of considering this different this conflict between what users want this kind of appetite and need for more diverse narratives um, more diverse figures to be kind of available um, as um, for people's personal representation and for kind of understanding our, our um, shared histories but also what responsibility 
we have to these record subjects who we are recording. I use this illustration on this slide, um, the Burns Hepburn Report, um, which is quite an American context with this, but it was exploring sort of gender and race and how it's been um, represented in acquisitions in major museums. And it's been quite an interesting kind of backdrop to this because the context around like archives versus museums versus art museums, the, the, the conversations are really different, but some of the kind of ethical questions um, start to kind of converge. And I'm not going to spend too long on this, but just briefly on my uh, methodology and particularly just to kind of say real thanks to Clarissa Chu and the Curatorial Research Center for a lot of the work they've done in terms of looking at inclusive terminology and um, specific words that are being used. Um, this created quite a lot of foundation for some of my research. I was looking at the UK cat thesaurus as well. Um, and I did a survey which had about 37 responses and I did some personal interviews to understand different people's processes. Um, during my residency, which my fellowship was with Queen Mary University, I ran a workshop um, describing people to find people, which was exploring kind of self-description as well as what as a user, what you would be looking for in terms of information. Um, and then I looked through kind of common versus discovery and how these two systems were being used to catalog this information. Uh, I want to highlight that basically I don't have, I didn't, I never got a lot of usable data sets from my research, but I got a lot of indicative um, trends, which were useful for kind of steering some of my questions, but um, in no way what I found is comprehensive and my research methodology would need to be a lot more rigorous to try and get um, some of these questions answered. Um, and things that were outside of scope were things like content notes, but they came up, came up a lot, especially around some of the questions to do with cataloging race. Um, and there was a, an initial desire to create a suggested thesaurus um, and I wasn't able to do that, but there were, are about 1,285 combined terms from the research that I found that could be used to start to work up maybe um, more of a, um, a series of um, uh, search terms. So my uh, starting assumptions were um, as follows, that despite potential spaces for information and in records management databases um, for known identity information that falls within the special category data, um, that this information was not collected, or if it was done, it was done inconsistently around record subjects. That because of this, permissions were around this information were not sought as standard practice, um, and it's not often considered the sort of permissions we wanted to collect around living subjects and their protective characteristic data for the um, for our archive, and that these oversights had particular peculiarities in regards to race and ethnicity, and that that could be due to kind of inconsistency in language used today, um, and in, and historically to describe race, which often combines people's nationality, ethnicity, and sometimes religion, um, but also that there might be a correlation between the demographic of the archive sector um, record specialists. Um, as being primarily predominantly white. And so kind of that erasure um, being a part of that um, lack of awareness around this um, or lack of lived experience. Um, most of the investigation so far and the sort of work really focused on racism and offensive language in records and that there was a strong appetite from the public as well as within our, um, the sector for more stories about people of color in records across the UK and the wider world and particularly beyond this idea of the extraordinary, the first, the last, the best, um, people were kind of looking for more stories of everyday representation. And that when ethnicity is not listed, there was an unacknowledged assumption that the record subject was white. I quickly kind of identified that there were three major stakeholders in this groups in, in this research, those who are being represented. And so their experience of their racial identity and ethnicity and culture outside of and in addition to racism was something that was going to be self central to the project. So kind of capturing the pain and the joy, but also the mundanity, the mundanity and excellence. Um, this is often in terms of 
some anti-racism practices and decolonial practice, this idea of this end point where um, everybody is allowed to be mediocre and that we don't, that different groups don't have to um, be twice as good to take up the same amount of space. Um, and that's a, a rhetoric that's really strong within different communities of color. So I wanted to explore kind of that element of how we capture beyond the kind of excellence um, and explorations of self-description and changing language within that. Um, this often manifests in changing based on trends, based on um, geographies and people's kind of where they're raised, um, different kind of cultures across the world and the different language histories um, and the uses of the of different words in different spaces, but also um, different generations within the same communities. So the language is, is ever evolving and is quite complex because of this. Um, the second stakeholder group was those searching for diverse representation. So these are researchers, students, um, news um, reporters, um, anyone really kind of wanting to find evidence of this longer history of diversity and wanting results primarily based on kind of contemporary language. Um, these might be people who are not particularly aware of archival practice in um, a standard. Um, it might be really young people um, and those who are not necessarily prepared to, or who, if they are prepared to, it's still kind of damaging to encounter kind of racial discrimination um, as the language that they have to navigate to find these histories. Um, and who might kind of fall back on the use of tropes to find more expected narratives. And these sorts of tropes might be easier to find on a Google search than they would be in an archive setting. And then thirdly, those who are responsible for the cataloging. So those who want to create a usable data set um, whose practices involves questioning the relevance of information um, that they're adding into the data and might find that they caught up in that the question of is somebody's racial identity relevant to the narrative, so should I include it or not? And confusion, who might have confusion over the choice of language to make, especially when it's it's been changing and you're looking at historical data versus contemporary data. Um, and those who are facing the reality of that this information, especially historically, might it's highly likely that it's not known. Um, and that um, that might require some investigation and that question of who is kind of creating that racial term. Is this, when we're looking at records um, for the um, transatlantic slavery, who is determining somebody's race and whose voice do we want to privilege can add to a lot of complexities. Um, and the idea of this kind of mix of ethnicity, race, um, nationality, and sometimes religion kind of creating this confusion and the homogeny of things like BAME as a term, um, making things harder to kind of untangle into specificity and affecting people's confidence and the vocabulary on racialized experiences um, and their significance. Um, so there were sort of three main um, concepts that also affected um, my research. One were this idea of design justice principles. When exploring sort of the database, I wanted to explore concepts of um, justice and design and, and the questions of algorithms and AI kind of came up, come up a little, late, but little bit later. I'm not hugely confident in a lot of that, but I um, this sort of idea of the systems being created um, uh, to replicate the exploitations um, in society was really important to be to be mindful of. Um, I was really influenced by black feminism and anti-capitalism ideas, um, exploring um, how these different modes of supremacy kind of affect the way that information has been captured, but also the ways that we have inbuilt um, assumptions about what this information means when it's there or not there and when to include it. But also the really important understanding of um, looking for joy and pleasure as a form of resistance and self-care um, to, to be mindful that, you know, different racial identities are not kind of only existing as oppositions to uh, in this reality of racism or the experience of racism, um, but that there's, you know, people have a lot of joy in the kind of just their experience of themselves and their body and making um, space for that. And then queer theory and queering was really important in that idea of 
challenging heteronormativity or challenging kind of this idea of um, a normative um, standard that might have moral applications um, or assumptions um, and the sort of binary other that is kind of sit um, sat in, in, in opposition but not necessarily um, brought to the forefront of people's minds and sort of a nuanced approach to absence that has been practiced a lot when looking at kind of queer figures throughout time. Um, and yeah, this idea that there's no set normal, just constant changing normal norms. I'm gonna go through now with just the three main um, kind of questions that and findings that I kind of came through my research. And I'm gonna end on the recommendations that I'm starting to form. Um, so the first one was sort of this, this main ethical question. Um, and it was how do we approach addressing user needs for discoverable, fig discoverable figures from racial minority communities in UK archives, whilst also balancing this responsibility to record subjects. Um, so again, it's this quite idea of what's the difference between our legal responsibility and our ethical responsibility and changing identities and um, changing minds being really important for living subjects um, and how should these kind of sit when um, how sit alongside ideas of the right to be forgotten when we're dealing with living um, subjects but also those who have passed and their families and I never really kind of cracked this one except to really come to this idea of um, making sure that where people are living, that they are involved in the conversations, that we um, are capturing the ways they represent themselves, describe themselves, um, the considerations they have, and maybe different versions of their identity um, as they've, you know, if their, their identity has changed through their life, how to capture this. There was a lot of stronger research um, kind of on being undertaken in this area around um, transgender narratives and people's um, changing kind of identity in the record. Um, and I would suggest kind of going through that and kind of building upon that more. With the idea of racial identities, it, it kind of came a lot more into language around um, offensive terms um, and how we dealt with that. But I hadn't seen um, space for looking at things like the nuance of people from the Caribbean kind of, you know, starting with our elders wanting to say West Indian and then Caribbean and the more specific islands um, as people um, kind of delved into that. But what I did find was that there wasn't really a thesaurus that allowed kind of that minutia anyways. There, in terms of the history that I was finding, um, the languages that I was finding in the records, the minutia came about offensive words. There was, there's a lot of specificity in different kinds of offensive terminology, but not really that specificity of um, kind of hybrid identities, people who hyphenate their, their names. When I did a lot of the kind of self description work, people often wanted to kind of include a hyphenate that I was this plus this plus this, um, but also maybe even like a note that this is how they identified, but they had these tensions with um, some of what that might mean. Um, particularly this came about when um, subjects were trying to explore their relationship with the, with being English and um, identifying with um, that, that word um, and the identity and what the applications had been in terms of other racial life spaces. Um, I sort of came to the conclusion that our ability to change what we do changes when people die less so than our ethical responsibility. So while someone is alive, we should take as much opportunity as possible to try and be as ethical as we can be because the opportunity for that and the clarity for people's own self-expression changes, our ability to, to do that changes when they, they're no longer living. Um, the second area was this idea of evolving language and self-description. So this idea of what changes when subjects self-describe versus um, ticking boxes that we have. Um, and the main issue with that is that the data gets more complicated, it's more fluid, um, you get lots of different combinations. We've tried this with live records, but with, with um, live data for people who are visiting our services and 
we were able to find that, um, for example, if we had like a homogenous group that would normally read as sort of just white, um, white British, um, Irish, Welsh within that kind of tab, that once we created this option for multiple identities, ticking multiple boxes and self-description, that whilst that group would normally read as one data set, um, that, that actually could turned into 125 different combinations of ways people would identify, um, which is really beautiful in one way because it allows that space to understand the complexities of different people's identity, um, but it's, it's also more difficult to, from a data managing uh, perspective and being able to return usable data sets. It's really important to have multiple, um, to have kind of larger groups um, and I guess the, it, the kind of conclusion I'm drawing with that is that we can have both if we can try and keep the overarching kind of tick box that we normally have in our collection, as well as space for the more nuances, then we'd be able to still recall the relevant um, records, we would also be able to provide a little bit more insight into how someone might describe. Um, we know that there's a lot of um, change in terms of best practice around language and what can be seen as offensive and problematic. Um, and I use some examples on screen, um, but kind of exploring when we're this idea of self-description um, and reclaiming language as being kind of an interesting problem to for archives to consider. So what happens when someone is self-describing and we're able to capture that within the record and they want to reclaim potentially hurtful words um, as a form of empowerment um, within their practice, but how this is read when it's in our databases and kind of perceived as the institutional voice using some of this language. Because um, it's really important to me to not sort of tell people how to describe themselves, um, which I'm sure a lot of us agree on, um, but then kind of what happens with that, to translate that to users versus the record subjects um, is kind of an important and interesting debate. And I'm sure lots of different ways to do that with different content notes, but um, just flagging that there. Um, and yeah, the idea kind of what context would be needed to um, showcase self descriptions um, within that archival setting. So how could we make it clear that what a user is reading are the words of um, the person rather than of the archivist and how we can make more space for multivocality. I know there are lots of different practices in doing that so um, I'd be interested to kind of do further research in this area. Um, I was really kind of influenced by the idea of um, algorithmic redlining and marginalized histories and the idea that if a marginalized narrative, marginalized community is not sort of forefronted within the design process that the evidence shows that these are the become the most um, inaccessible resources that are created because we're not naming the barriers which things need to kind of um, overcome and this sort of explains lots of different design history such as um, why seatbelts are less safe for women because it wasn't identified to kind of consider um, female bodies as um, as explicitly needing to be kind of included in the design process. Um, and um, an example of how um, airport security scanners are very trans exclusive because the process of identifying whether somebody is um, suspicious or not meets um, basically a, has a gender binary involved in it. So the person looking at the screen um, has to compare what they see um, in person versus what's scanned. And if they don't match, that um, makes you suspicious, which is obviously very trans exclusive um, for people. Um, and I, this question, which is permeates throughout a lot of this research is where does offensive language sit? Um, this has been explored in lots of different ways by lots of different practitioners, um, but they, they do return a lot large set of relevant records um, and there, it's really important that this history is still really visible, um, but how do we make it so that um, more people are aware that this is what's happening, that the um, offensive language is hitting sort of in the algorithms we create for um, 
kind of or instructions to search engines. Um, what do we do when that language emerges and where do we put the content notes? Um, is something that's um, really important to um, within this work. And then how are databases functioning um, based on how they can how they're designed? So how did the data set um, emerge? Um, how can we co-design new systems based on principles of design justice that allowed us to include more representation of diverse racial identities in more complex ways um, and how people's race affects their lives. So this question of is this significant or relevant information um, being a conversation that we have with people, um, but also maybe that there is a more uniformed approach that we take to capturing people's identity when we have record subjects that we're adding into our collection. And then finally, there was this big question overarching um, within that kind of influence of um, Black feminist practice was, is there space to talk about race without racism? Um, I was really, I was really struck by when I looked through Clarissa's um, Chu's work that there were 935 terms um, that she'd identified that were um, potentially offensive. And um, when I looked through the UK cat thesaurus, I kept finding sort of these synonyms for how um, these terms had kind of come about, which were clearly that had clearly been derived from the histories that they were cataloging, but were quite um, upsetting when looked at in just sort of their raw data. So for example, the term mixed race has a synonym of um, um, social problems. And um, that's something that is not the kind of be all and end all of um, being mixed race. And there wasn't really space for these other kind of synonyms, things like love, or um, complexity, or you know, more more reality of what that life that that looks like isn't present because what we've kind of found is that a lot of the archive narratives, because of this kind of first and extraordinary, is talking about people overcoming or their race being kind of mentioned as kind of an encounter of racism, whether it's a positive story of of overcoming racism or a negative kind of narrative of capturing racism. Um, and yeah, just wanted to find out how do we create these spaces for joy and this mundanity. And so the process of the mundane for me was kind of built into this idea of if we create a uniform approach where with all record subjects, we try and make sure that we capture their racial identity. And if we don't, we put in the words unknown so that it becomes more of just an ad hoc inf information that we're added into the system but also kind of considering things that we have in regular um, um, processes now when working with people of preferred not to say, where someone wants to keep their racial identity when they're living um, out of the story, but that we have more of a uniform approach so that we're able to kind of find these spaces for history of race without racism being kind of the center of it. Um, within that question was also this really important one, which is how to find space um, a language and a source that includes whiteness, that we don't create it, this invisible, uh, make it this invisible norm, which all other races kind of de deviate from, and that allows spaces for kind of that interrogation of some of these complex relationships with things like English identity um, and kind of racial identities within that, but also that makes space for the nuances and um, um, of the kind of, of the white experience as well and the white experience not kind of being homogenized um, in the same way that all of the racial identities have been kind of homogenized. And so these were just my like final, my, my, my working resources, um, working recommendation, recommendations at the moment. So the source and vocabulary and databases um, are only really accessible if you understand history of race relations in the UK, if you also understand how archives function but they're not really useful for discovery purposes. So school age researchers looking to find narratives of, sort of like a black female historical figure would find it very difficult to kind of find that within the archive um, without kind of going to explicit learning resources, but kind of just kind of into the database itself. And so because of this and lack of awareness, there's much more um, of a turn to search engines like Google and um, within kind of algorithms of oppression and all the research we've looked at, the kind of capitalist influences of those spaces means that we're really kind of returning 
something that has a its own kind of um, bias based um, um, search. So as archives, we can try to provide more of um, a space from kind of that uh, sponsored search engine type um, 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 approach. And then the current sources we have are based on histories, um, on bias, bias histories and bias ideas of what's significant and not. And so they don't really holistically co consider the different interests that users might have today or historically. And so we do need to have interventions in the database with that kind of understanding built in. Um, and if we understand that, say, that race is a social construct, um, that's really important to kind of frame this, but it means that a lot of the identities that we're going to be finding in the records um, that are complex and multifaceted with nationalities and ethnicities, um, that these identities were often forged through kind of necessity and sometimes violence, um, but they're often really important sources of pride and unity and resistance. So we want to make space to kind of talk about that complex um, on this, um, reality. And so to record creators, my, my current recommendations are, if the subject is living, seek their self-description because it will have more longevity and you're able to kind of practice these, this ethical approach. Um, that we can seek to collectively design the search queries and taxonomies that incorporate race um, with people from different race, racial ethnicities. Um, that we don't assume right, whiteness if the race is absent and that we don't apply an assumed right, whiteness. So by not including or indicating um, ethnicities when they're known um, and, the, and the subject is white. And then to consider joy and mundanity in relation to racialized experiences. So not just focusing on this history of uh, pain and discrimination or excellence, but also trying to find ways that we can make, we can challenge normative assumptions by kind of making the information about different people more normal as well. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here the rest of the slides, just my bibliography. Excellent, thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Um, so we'll move on to uh, questions now, if uh, Jenny, Holly and Rachel want to come back on screen. Um, if you've got, uh, if anyone watching has any questions, do feel free to submit those um, in the Q and A button. Um, we've got just under um, 15 minutes for this and we've got uh, a few questions in already. So I'll, I'll work through those that have been uh, submitted. So the first one, um, is for Jenny, um, which is, will, there's two parts to this question. Um, so first one is, will you be publishing your findings? And the second is, are you able to say which models you looked at, even though the transcripts are embargoed? Okay, I'll take the first part first, easiest one to deal with. Um, yes, I um, I have got some plans to publish um, my research. I gave a presentation on some of the archival theory um, at the end of last year, and I've got a chapter proposal in for that. So hopefully um, that will come to something. And if it doesn't, I will look at other opportunities to publish that. Um, and um, I would like to write up other parts of my um, fellowship. Um, but yeah, it's a bit TBC at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, um, in terms of, sort of models of practice, um, um, I've had a look at some of the, um, the approaches to surveying, so looking at how um, archival surveying um, is traditionally done and how that could be um, varied. Um, I've looked quite a lot at um, models of community collecting and I suppose different variations um, on similar themes, um, so um, where there's support given to community groups with either equipment or training. Um, and definitely um, looking at more of a post-custodial model for that kind of approach. Um, I've also looked at some of the relationships that, and how those relationships, um, I suppose, are navigated and negotiated and renegotiated um, between groups and repositories and whether it's um, an advisory um, relationship or whether it's um, based on depositing material in a recognised um, repository. 
Um, and I've also looked a little bit at um, activists um, and how um, activist groups manage um, their archives and how that might um, develop and change over time as the activist group changes over time. Excellent, thank you. Um, the next question I believe came in uh, for Holly, but might be relevant um, to all of our panel. And it's how do different organizations determine which terms are sensitive? Which is a bit of a tricky question, I admit. Mm, it is a tricky question. Um, it's incredibly subjective and it's very hard to approach how you as an individual organization is gonna go about it. Because the first time I was working on offensive language workflows was when I was working on a different collection. It was kind of a rural life and heritage collection. And so obviously the terminology in that is gonna be very different from the terminology that's in the Women's Aid um, archive. And um, so I guess weighing in what your collection specifically um, goes into. So having catalogued a lot of the Women's Aid collection, I know some of the sensitive material and terminology that they use. So I kind of know what to search for. Um, but yeah, there's, a, I guess the radical empathy approach is one where you look at um, various things that could be sensitive, even if you don't find them sensitive or offensive, potentially someone else does. And then the other end of the spectrum is maybe not flagging anything and just having an overarching umbrella policy that says you might come across sensitive offensive um, terminology. So there's a huge spectrum of how you can approach it and my research basically showed that everyone's doing it differently and um, we're all just trying our best to figure it out but yeah it's tricky especially when you're sat trying to think of offensive or sensitive terms to search for which is like a really horrible part of the workflow but unfortunately is quite an important part for flagging the records. So I don't think that answers it. Does anyone else have the answer? Um, no, uh, I think that there were, there's a certain understanding of um, that there's some words that are like obviously offensive in almost every context and those are much easier to, to kind of deal with. Um, but when you get to certain terms, it's kind of a lot more confusing and those are where we have a lot of the issues. Um, but yeah, I think um, part of the consideration people have is the size of their collection and the backlog it would take and the labor it would take to kind of do individual um, responses versus more of a blanket approach. And there's also this question of telling people that something is going to upset them. Um, if in, in, it might not. So there's some approaches to just as much detailed content notes as you can have around what might be included and the types of history that is going to be seen in the record and hoping that that provides enough context that people are aware that maybe the words might not be offensive, but the kind of con the content is still heavy because sometimes people can really use non-offensive terms, but the collection still needs to be treated in a similar way in that you might do if, some, if there was like um, offensive terms in it. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so moving on to uh, the next question, it's another one for you, um, Holly, and uh, kind of features around the Your Story event. Um, so there's a few parts to this question. Um, so first one, uh, how did you capture the feedback uh, from the event? Did you transcribe uh, the conversation so they're ready to use? And will the documented uh, conversations be stored in the archive? So it was definitely um, uh, one of the first steps was figuring out how we were going to do it. So what we ended up doing was a very simplistic farm, which was basically space to jot down what you were talking about. Um, also a space for either the name or the organization of the person. And um, I also included an area to capture the signature of the person that kind of said, I consent for this information. Um, to potentially be used for future exhibitions or the catalogue. It was a bit of a caveat at the bottom. So that's what we settled on. And there was definitely pros and cons to it. We didn't actually, sometimes you couldn't get a signature because it was quite a free flowing, casual conversation. And sometimes it's 
a bit jarring to then be like, can you sign this form, especially when you're having quite sensitive conversations sometimes. Um, but it was a it was an invite event. So we do have the contact details of the organizations that came. So that's something we can deal with another way. But yeah, the idea of jotting down things when you're having a conversation is quite unnatural because you want to really encourage these people to share often quite personal stuff. Um, so you want the eye contact and things like that. And it seems rude sometimes to kind of be using a clipboard, which is quite a far more way of doing it. Um, but we managed to keep it quite casual and, and just jotted down quite freehand um, the different things we were talking about. Um, so this was then collated at the end, all of the sheets of paper of our various volunteers. And then I've typed them all up into one Word document. Um, so I think that is the first part of the thing. How did we catch a fever? Second, we, yeah, we transcribed it so it's all in one document. And then how this is going to be starred is a big question. So one of the things with current databases is they're quite traditionally archive uh, related where there isn't the space to put things like user generated content or perhaps more or less stringently archive facts, dates, creators. So in the past, I know that things like the Revisiting Collections um, initiative, they've found um, problems with this. I've just seen the time. I'm rambling on for ages. But basically, I think we're going to put it in the narratives module of EMU. If anyone uses EMU, um, it's a way of connecting to different catalogue records. It's a good way of starring it, but this isn't viewable on the online catalogue. There's flaws in every uh, way of doing this, but hopefully we can signpost that um, this information is available and we can use it ourselves in things like blog posts and stuff like that. Oh God, well, I'm talking for ages. Sorry, oh, that was not comprehensible. Problem. Not a problem at all. Um, so this question's uh, for Jenny and kind of revolves around acceptance in lieu. Um, and if you have any sense that the scheme will change and become more inclusive, particularly looking at the need of having to fund uh, an official valuation up front, which can potentially act as a barrier. I suppose um, acceptance in lieu was kind of the starting point for my research. Um, but ultimately, I didn't really look at this um, a huge amount in the end. Um, I would say, um, from my knowledge of the scheme, it's unlikely to change in the future. It, it kind of is what it is. Um, but there are other schemes, um, and maybe it's it's looking at making the best use of those and also um, raising awareness of some of the other schemes that are available, such as um, what's the cultural gift scheme. Um, I think there's also a lot of the schemes use quite similar criteria. So um, what's it called? The reviewing committee on um, export. Um, of works of art and objects of cultural interest. Um, a lot of them use similar criteria sort of based on the, um, the Waverley criteria. Um, and I think that definitely um, these criteria are not used um, to cover as, as wide a range of collections as I think they could be. I think you could definitely make the case um, for collections to be accepted under some of these schemes. Um, that aren't at the moment. Um, I think there's also a big issue around sort of communication and knowledge of these of a lot of these schemes, um, because um, generally it's the really well-known, um, high-profile things that get the press coverage, um, and a lot of um, archive creators, archivists themselves, don't know about um, putting material forward for schemes. Um, probably. Um, as much as they should do um but yeah this this was an avenue of my research that i started to consider and then um it, we didn't i didn't progress with it and so just looked at it in the early um days um somebody else might be able to um give a better answer on acceptance and new um at the national archives um but yeah um from my perspective i don't i don't see it changing anytime soon Excellent, thank you. Just wary of time as, as we're coming quite close to the end and we've still got a few questions to run through. Um, so potentially fairly 
quick answers. Um, uh, another one for you, Jenny. Do you think the preservation of context can sometimes be a hindrance for non-dominant archival collections, especially if they don't have the space slash resources when building their collection in the first place? Um, it's an interesting point. It's not something that came up in any of my um, interviews. Um, a lot of, um, particularly the activist groups, were really um, interested in capturing a lot of that context and the sort of the information that sat around things. Um, it might be less formal than um, archive um, practitioners. So um, the dreaded post-it note um, stuck onto things, explaining the context of creation and, and sort of giving some of its background. Um, so I'd say um, it's not something I came across. I'll give a quick answer. Okay, thank you. Um, and this one uh, from Rachel looking at um, glossaries and uh, whether there is a difference of emphasis, emphasis where some glossaries um, uh, emphasise problematic terminology and others inclusive terminology. Um, kind of looking through at the, the question, um, whether there's an idea around universal self-descriptions and languages of empowerment, empowerment, but is there a case for focusing on a thesaurus of racism as the most urgent aspect of redressing vast catalogues and outdated and harmful information? Um, taking that larger point, I think that there is a lot of research going on around the source of racism, and that's what I found, that there is actually quite an interesting amount of energy going into that field but that, um, that, that what, what's coming up is that this is really emotionally laborious work if we're working with different people from different, with who this is a reality of their lived experience for, that's quite difficult, but we're trying to include that in the designing of the process. But that even those collections that work sort of based um, in communities of color that have this idea of joy being the foundation of it, that the language still is really hurtful in there too. And that there is still some, um, there's, what's missing is the conversational language or the reality that people from these communities actually have about talking about themselves, their identity, their experiences in a way that isn't centered on kind of the kind of the racist stereotypes or tropes or, you know, they're more kind of based in reality. Holly mentioned it around communities um, externally being perceived as um, silent, but actually within those communities, the language they use to describe themselves or their experiences is not does not subscribe to that and we're not capturing that language and possibly this means that we need to be capturing things outside of English more so that we're able to capture that because it could be that some of this is the translation into a Eurocentric perspective on different people's experiences across the world but also it could just be that in terms of the information that exists in the records what we're mostly capturing anyways is harmful records um, records of kind of the reality of race and racism um, as this, and that there is a big piece of urgent work around that in anti-racism practice. But I really want to see if we're designing things for people about themselves, um, about their own experiences, that we, um, it would be different. I think the focus on kind of making ra racism visible is something that is a practice that's focused towards people who don't understand that racism, like the reality of racism as a personal experience. And so if we recenter who the collection is for, then the language would also have to include more joy, more modernity. Thank you. Um, so last couple of questions, and um, this one's for kind of all three of you. Um, so would any of you consider applying for research grants to further your work as a, as a result of the fellowship? So I'll look at my screen and go uh, top left first, Holly. Um, I think mine has been quite a practical fellowship. So I'm in a short term contract, well, um, an externally funded project for the Women's Aid Archive. And this fellowship has been a great thing to do alongside that. So it's allowed me to dive a little bit deeper into things around inclusive cataloging. So it's been a great side by side with my project archivist role. So I, that's how I've viewed my fellowship. And I don't think that I'd necessarily branch out into grant work, but um, I know the others are maybe more research centered. So maybe you guys will. I'll, I'll move down to, to Jenny next. 
Um, I think, I don't know if I'd apply for a formal um, grant. Um, I have used this as an opportunity um, to, we get 10% time at work for sort of professional development. And I've used this as to basically ring fence my 10% time, um, which generally I was terrible at doing. Um, and I found that the structure of this fellowship was really great at motivating me um, to actually do what I said I'd do um, rather than um, procrastinate or find something else that was very urgent to do um, and do that instead. Um, I am going to attempt to continue some of my working um, structure. Um, so to carry on some of my research and look at some of the things that came up from my fellowship um, and how, but probably take them in a slightly more um, work centered way. So looking a bit more at how we manage our data on accessions um, and looking a bit um, probably at practically how we might look at um, participatory collecting and engaging with communities and things like that. So I think in the next year or two, I probably wouldn't be applying for anything formally, um, but I would like to use the structure of my working week to allow me to continue exploring some of these and definitely um, writing up. So whether it's in um, professional journals or whether it's more through um, some of our, um, we've got SACS, um, which is um, short form articles. So um, using that um, a bit more regularly than I have done. Thank you. And, and finally, Rachel. Um, probably not, because I struggle, I've struggled to kind of ring fence my time for this. Um, and um, while I've, research is really important in terms of my practice, I'm, I think I work better in kind of, this is a, a, the problem that I need to research to solve in a more ad hoc way. Um, but it's, it's something that I hope other people are building on and I want to help more people do the research. I think that's where I'd love to be. I'd like to to kind of remain as somebody who can amplify this work and, and help those who have more time and more space to kind of really delve down some of the rabbit holes that kept emerging.